All right, um, and we are back. Um, I'd like to introduce the first of our two um, uh, esteemed uh, uh, academics and product managers to talk about some of the work that the lab has been doing uh, with Charlie Nesson, who many of you may know is the co-founder of the Berkman Klein Center and is kindly sharing some of his work today, along with product manager Lara Schul. So I'll let the two of you take it away. Um, can people hear me okay? Okay, nice. Um, so this picks up one of the threads from the panel actually about the constraints that exist on speech in closed group settings. So the risks that you face from people who might judge you or who have direct power over you. Um, and we're talking about NIM space. Oh, okay. Um, I'm Lara Schull. I used to have pronouns. I'm a product manager at the lab. This is Professor Nesson. Charlie. Charlie. Um, do you want to say a little about um, why you founded the Bergman Klein Institute? Interesting discourse. Why did I found this? <laughs> well, I think it was in order to persuade Lessig to come to Harvard. I, that was like <laughs> definitely totally a, a motivation. Um, it was just a view that cyberspace was opening up. It was a completely new thing. It was grounded in universities connecting with each other. Education was uh, a, a, a tremendously motivating element of the beginning of the Berkman Center. It stayed that way for quite a while. Then commercialism kind of crept in to the net and into the focus of the center. Uh, and I would say that this session, unlike the last session, is focused back on university. It's university discourse that's my interest. It's my classroom as the place that I start thinking from. And it's that that's given rise to the exploration of pseudonymy as a, an element that can be very positive in an educational environment. Cool. Um, yeah, so what is NIMSpace? It's a pseudonymous discussion forum. Um, right now it exists as a web app that works on mobile and desktop. Um, it's not perfect, but we're going to demo it today and hopefully it will work. Um, and it's also fully open source. The tech stack um, uses Vue, Node.js, and MongoDB. So if you're an engineer and you want to contribute to our code, visit our GitHub. I'll share the link later. Um, and yeah, we're exploring how pseudonymity can foster more open and constructive discussion within closed group environments. Um, Professor Nelson's interest is primarily the classroom. I'm interested in other environments as well, like workplaces, community groups. Um, reading groups, etc. Um, the problem space that we're intervening in is that open and honest communication can be really difficult in closed group environments. Closed group being there's some restriction on membership and often, but not always, membership is sustained over a period of time. So a workplace, a classroom. Um, and it's difficult because there are risks. There can be the risk of retaliation from some authority figure if you say something they don't like, a boss or a professor. Um, and that can also just be the risk of embarrassment or social shaming. Um, and these risks are often more acute if you are or you're believed to be in the minority. Hand it to you to talk about the concepts a little more. Well, all right. Lara's talking about the risks in a small group environment. I want to shift to talk about the freedoms in a small group environment. And I'd like to take off from something Deb described, which is the intimacy gradient. As he described it, it's an architectural thing with the bedroom as the private space. I would ask you to think about it not with the bedroom as the core space, but as the self, the individual, the student, the person who's come to the center and think of that core space there as just you, just you in your mind, where you have freedom to think whatever you want to think. And then imagine what's the space right outside the bedroom? What's the space that's right outside of my mind where I can think whatever I want? That's this NIM space environment 
That's this environment where I'm giving voice to my thought. I'm giving voice in a closed group of a classroom or in the closed group of our center or in any other of these closed groups that we're interested in. And the fact that it's pseudonymous means that I can put the message out, but I don't get feedback coming back to me as an identity. I'm able to speak in that environment and give voice to my thought with consideration that my classmates will be reading it. It's not like I'm ready to say whatever I want to say. I have constraint, and it is, to me, a very important distinction between freedom of thought, which I believe is central to university life, and freedom of expression, which is also central to university life, but is different from freedom of thought. It takes into account the norm established between you and whomever you are speaking to. <coughs> and so I think of the pseudonymous space as that space right next to the black dot, the space into which you speak, but it doesn't come back to you in anything that's reputationally threatening. And then beyond that space, all right, then into full name space, even in a small group, and then into the whole class, and then into the wider ambit of university. And at the outside, the public sphere. So for me, it is crucial to understand that university is not the public sphere. University is a protected place within which students come to learn to be comfortable with themselves in the discourse that's internal, in discourse with others within their class and so forth, and at the conclusion of the process, graduate into the public sphere. Ah, uh, what do you see there on the left? You see th something called the Necker cube. Can you all see it two ways? Can everybody see it two ways? Nope, nope, nope. Come on, you keep looking, you'll see it. One face is forward, another face is forward. <laughs> Aha! Can any of you see it both ways at the same time? No, you can't. You can't. You can think maybe you are, but you're not. All right, so this is a metaphor. This is a metaphor for dyadic thinking, right, wrong thinking, the idea that what we're talking about are issues of difference and there's one side that's right and there's one side that's wrong, or there's one side that's false and there's one side that's true. Hmm. So it's a very good metaphor for discourse and disagreement. Can you imagine looking at it from a third point of view? Can you imagine taking that two-dimensional representation of a cube and seeing it in three dimensions without it being dyadic? Is there a third point of view from which it's possible to observe difference? Well, yes, there is. Zittern showed it to me when I was teaching him. That was almost like the beginning of the Berkman Center. He was my student in an evidence class. I teach about evidence and proof and how do you know what's true and things like that. And he came up to me with a three-dimensional version of the cube. Do we have a picture of it? 
We don't. No, dear. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, think about it this way. The sun revolves around the earth. We can see it. It comes up in the morning, it goes around, it comes back, comes around this way. For many, many centuries, people thought the sun revolves around the earth. When Copernicus imagined looking at the system from the viewpoint of Mars, suddenly the system looks different. All right, this, this is what mediators learn. This is what a lot of good lawyers, some not, but some good ones, <laughs> learn. That is to be able, as a lawyer, to state a case in such a balanced way, right at the outset, as you're opening your argument to the bench, right at the outset, so that the judges who had their idea about what was right and what was wrong and were ready to jump in with questions, as they listen to you to state the case, they say, ooh, this person understands my side of the case. <clears throat> On both sides. And the result is that the bench is quiet when you get to the point of making your argument. They're saying, this guy really understands. I'm interested in what that person has to say. That's the, what, what good mediators do. That's what good teachers do. That's what students need to learn. When at our last graduation, Dean Rakesh Kurana. I want to make sure we have time to do an emphasis. <laughs> um, I'll tell you later. Grab Charlie, <laughs> grab Charlie off of this if you want to talk more. <laughs> Um, I just want to make sure we have time to get to the demo. Um, okay, so recapping some of the benefits of pseudonymity. Um, it creates some kind of privacy similar to privacy that exists in physical space that enables intimacy and trust. Um, it also makes it easier to change your mind. You can express something under a pseudonym and then say something different in real life without having to hold to your previous opinion. You can hear a wider variety of opinions. Um, but also anyone who has used any kind of anonymous social media before probably knows that horrible behavior happens in pseudonymous and anonymous spaces. Um, so you may indeed ask, does an anonymity breed heinous behavior? Yes, our hypothesis is that this is more often the case in the open web where people have no stake in the group that they're participating in. So they don't really care if they get banned from the Reddit group. And they also don't really care if they completely blow up the Reddit group and it ceases to exist because they didn't really have any connection to it in the first place. Similarly, if you don't know any of the people who are in the group you're interacting in, then you don't see the harm that you cause. Um, in closed groups, can the human relationships that exist in the social dynamics um, create different incentives and incentivize more thoughtful engagement and prevent some of the heinous behavior that we see in anonymous open web environments? We've seen some evidence that it can and we want to explore it a bit further. Um, another question you might ask is, shouldn't people just feel empowered to speak openly without the cover of pseudonymity? Uh, yeah, in a lot of environments they should, but the risks that we mentioned at the beginning prevent people from doing that. So we want to try NIMSpace as kind of a sandbox or a first step towards more open true name communication. Um, one note on who this is and is not designed for, it is designed for groups who actually want to develop a more open, discursive environment. It's not going to fix your discourse, your discourse environment if you have a hostile workplace that consistently retaliates against people who say negative things to bosses. Um, so our belief is that there are groups that exist that do want to foster more open, discursive cultures and are struggling to do so. I think Berkman is one, Harvard Classrooms are another, ASML is another, and I'm sure you all can list many more. Um, so in those groups, can NIMSpace help? I was now going to do some top-down norm setting before we jump into NIM space, but Charlie challenged me to do some collective norm setting. So once we get into NIM space, um, we will, the first part, we'll spend five minutes writing some norms that we want to share as a group. Um, unfortunately for the people on the live stream, um, you will be doing this in Zoom instead of in NIM space. So Guzo, if you want to crack open the Zoom chat. Um, yeah, it's kind of... NIMSpace is designed for smaller groups. This is kind of a feature and not a bug since the risks of anonymity tend to explode with group size. 
Um, so we're already going to be pushing it a little bit with this in-person group. So hopefully it won't break. If it lags, then please bear with us. Um, OK, we're going to be having a bit of a discussion around the question of what an ideal collaborative, collaborative learning environment looks like. Um, folks in person, if you turn to the back screen, the back whiteboard, there is a short link that you can use to access the NIM space on whatever device you have at handy. And folks on the live stream, um, we will invite you to participate in the Zoom chat, which is not anonymous. Um, so feel free to think about how you might express yourself differently if you were. Can we go over to the name space? Cool. OK, just a couple things to point out. Your pseudonym, um, sorry, Guzo, you're not anonymous anymore. Your pseudonym is in the top right corner. You can change it. Um, these are randomly assigned, so it has nothing to do with who you are. Um, and you'll see the threads on the left-hand side, and people are already chatting. Um, yeah. Feel free to take a couple minutes to think about what norms you would like us to embrace as a group during this NIM space session. Well, let me respond just a little bit to something Lara said. It definitely requires a group in which there's some bond of trust to begin with. Like, you've all come here because you're interested, and presumably not here just to make things not work. So you're, you're in a sense, amongst friends, and that's just like a classroom, especially a university classroom where you sign up for classes, you choose to take a particular course, you're in a room with a lot of other people whom you know are different from you, who have different views, and the whole idea of being able to transcend the biases that each of us has from whatever the particular growth environment we've come up through, an exchange with people who've come from different places and test out what it is that we came in knowing to be true may turn out not to be quite so true. And the very idea of understanding bias and learning that bias is the point in a deliberation at which you stop being open to evidence that contradicts you. As soon as you hit that point, that's your closed mind point. And the closed mind is the same thing as bias. And so the very idea of a classroom enterprise, which has as its objective leading students to be in a sandbox environment that's got safe qualities to it, but then progressing to face-to-face, -face, real space, discourse, engaging on the issues of difference among us. It comes to see the differences that exist as the very asset base that we have for transcendence. And that's the learning process. That's, I believe, the central learning process of a university education. But it's not just university. It starts in kindergarten. We're just at the, the, the far end of it. Yeah, lots of contributions in the chat about norms. I just want to call out a few before we move on to the next session. Um, respect pseudonymity and anonymity. If you look over someone's shoulder and see their pseudonym, keep that to yourself. Um, no personal attacks, assume positive intent. Um, 
a norm for this group can be brevity since we're a temporary community, so we've got to use our time efficiently. I will keep that in mind. Avoid spam, open-mindedness, civility, assume positive intent, but be conscious of impact. Um, I'm sure you all have read the, the rest. Um, do you want to move over to the other thread of what an ideal collaborative learning environment looks like to you? And the framing of the question may be controversial to you. You may not believe that such a thing exists. So feel free to define that and however, define, contest that in however way you like. Yeah. Is there a microphone so that anybody? I think can... I heard the question. You, you, the ability to upvote. Yeah, we actually turned it off for this session because I knew that with the number of people here, it was going to completely break if we had upvoting. So mm -hmm. usually you can keep in mind what you might have upvoted, but yeah, sorry, we turned that off. And turned it off on the theory that the student coming in starts with the simplest environment, and then it gets complicated more complicated with other things that you can do in the environment. And one of those things is that with a check of a box, it becomes possible for you to post your own thread questions. That is, this is ultimately a coded version of a Habermasian public space. This is an ideal format in the sense of it codes the Chatham House rule. It, it, for those familiar, I'll just leave it at that. Well. Oh, yeah, Guzo, can we switch to the, thanks. Do you want to see what's going on in the chat? Hmm. I need to do something? No, do you want to see, you, if you want to see what's going on in the chat? Uh, no, no, you see. Okay. <laughs> I look later. <laughs> okay. My aspiration, I will say, is for the Berkman Center to become, to be, and be in the becoming of it, an ideal collaborative research community. One in which we're not invested in negative, unsupportive communication. Uh, that's an aspiration for a classroom, it's an aspiration for a center, it's an aspiration for a university, it's possibly an aspiration for a culture that's not grounded in commerce. It's ultimately an assertion that the university discourse environment is distinct from the commercial environment and distinct from the political environment. It is its own domain in which the very idea of freedom of thought is appreciated and freedom of expression is appreciated as a mutual collaborative engagement. I, I, I feel strongly that this is a very close link to what Larry is interested in. This is a democratic skill to get along with other people and to be comfortable in the different environments in which each of us as individuals relate. And if we can graduate students who are ready to relate with excellent democratic skills, we will be contributing to Larry's citizen assemblies. I just want to open the floor if anyone has thoughts either on the tool, the concept, the experience of using it, places you might want to use it, places you would hate to use it. Yeah, any thoughts? Hi, uh, my name is Adji. I'm a Master in Design Studies here at the GSD. And I was a little curious to understand a little bit more of how this tool would be used within the educational sphere 
because I think one of the great advantages of having a online space to debate ideas is also the ability to do it async. Um, and I guess that that's also something that allows people to think further their thoughts uh, differently than when we are in the same um, physical space. So I was wondering if the idea is this to be used in a classroom, then how, like, how would that work? Um, and if there would be a mediator or something like that, or no, if it's async, um, how can we go back to things that were said um, after discussions? I can give just a quick response, and then Charlie, who's actually used it in his classrooms, can talk further. But I think, in my, I think of it at least as a tool that's designed for synch like synchronous environments where there is true name, real life communication happening at the, um, side by side with NimSpace, so that things that come up in NimSpace can be addressed in real life, and you know things that are said in true name expression can be complemented with NimSpace. Um, I think there are other tools that provide asynchronous communication for classrooms. And I think what's novel about this is it actually allows people to have like a, um, a way to interact with what's happening in the true name discussion um, in real time. But Charlie has used it, so. The two most useful ways of using it that I've found, from a teacher's point of view, the opportunity to be able to pose a question to a class and have each student in the class take three minutes, four minutes, five minutes to write a paragraph. It's not instantaneous, call on you, you answer. It's you get to think a little bit before you say. And then to be able to see what every single person in the class has said before we actually get into small group discussion, face-to-face -face discussion, large group discussion. <coughs> the second thing, that's, that's a great thing for just dealing with the first mover problem of the first hand that goes up, all right, and teachers appreciate that. The second is feedback at the end of class. The idea of being able to have everyone in the class feedback at the end of the class, and then I, as a teacher, read their feedback and am able to respond to it and start the next class by everyone looking at my response to their feedback. It builds a trust loop that's based on the feeling of agency that comes from being able to make a suggestion, see that the teachers actually read it, and actually responding to it in some way. It actually creates an increasing trust bond within the group and an increasing attention to just being supportive, being positive, being plus. All right, your asynchronous question, the feedback that I offer is a little asynchronous. And at the same time, it's also quite possible to have a discussion continue after class in that pseudonymous environment. I haven't frankly, spent that much time with that, but I can definitely see it's a possibility. Just a question from online. I just wanted to say that uh, Institute for Everybody of Social Media is not a bot. There's a real person behind moderating, so you're hearing this person right now. Um, and the question is from Alexa Hyde saying, how do you maintain pseudonymity in a small group over time? In a classroom, I imagine students would eventually figure out who was who. First off, it's no big deal if somebody figures out who elated Bilby is. In fact, it's quite wonderful. In a very small group of like a dozen people, we start off with pseudonyms. As we get to know each other, we get to realize who Elated Bilby is. It's actually a way of starting to get to know people from their text and learning more about to a point where I know you well enough to know you're Guzo. That's, it's, it's not a disaster that your pseudonymity isn't rock solid. And I've found that in a class of 36, let's say, the pseudonymity is pretty solid. 
And the idea of being able to open a discussion with 36 people and then break into small groups of six to actually discuss the subject, it's just got a smooth quality to it. So uh, I, don't, I don't mean to offer it as a form of anonymity that's unbreakable. It's, that's not really the point. Uh, we have one more question. Yeah. Just, we've got a cut in a couple minutes. Hi, Catherine Feldman. Uh, I'm over at the business school and I focus on human-centered technology. How do you balance incentivizing higher quality responses with the pseudonymity and people wanting to have credit for their good ideas? How do you think about that trade-off? How do I think about it? Well, the first thing I found is that people aren't so anxious to be credited with their idea right off the bat. They're interested in having it be respected. Uh, and that doesn't require their name on it. And when they see it respected, then they'll speak it up in a room where, okay, uh, I know who you are. And it, it, it helps out the person whose idea is not so good because they get a sense back that maybe I got to think more about this. Uh, and often it's sort of more than possible for people to exchange, to, you know, address Nordic ocelot with a response at Nordic ocelot and come back with it. So we actually do have pretty good discussions that actually unfold in the pseudonymous space as well as leading into the outer spaces. I'd love to take more questions, but we have to cut. I just want to, can we go back to the slides for one second? I just want to show the GitHub links. And, um, yeah, if you want to check out our GitHub, it's these links. You can also come to me afterwards. If you want to use NIMSpace, um, feel free to reach out to both or either of us. We would love for you to use it in your classrooms, community groups, book clubs, whatever. Um, and yeah, thank you, Boku, Bo Boza Boku built a lot of what you've seen today. Sebastian allowed us to host this on Harvard servers instead of Charlie's computer. Um, <laughs> Brendan has been the ASML engineering lead on this for longer than I've been at the lab, so thank you. And Anthony worked on this for long before I did as well, and then space has been around for a while, so thanks. And thanks, uh, thank Laura here. Thank you, Laura.